attack helicopters, you've got to love them. And today we are talking about future attack reconnaissance aircraft. Now, if you're all aware of the Apache and the Comanche style aircraft, you'll definitely agree with me here when I talk about the Bell 360 Invictus being a hybrid look of the two of them combined. And it does look rather sexy. Now, Bell has finally taken the wraps off its contender for the US Army's future attack reconnaissance aircraft program. The Bell 360 Invictus is as interesting for what it looks like as to also what it can actually do. Bell's military offerings of late have been a blend of the legacy rotorcraft, the highly evolved UH-1 Venom and AH-1 Viper family, and the high technology bleeding edge tilt rotors such as the V-22 Osprey, the V-280 Valor which competing to replace the UH-60 Blackhawk in the US Army's future long range assault aircraft, and the striking mock-up of the V-247 Vigilant Tilt Rotor Unmanned Escort Platform, designed in response to the US Marine Corps' Unmanned Expeditionary Capabilities or MUX concept study. But there is no getting away from the fact that at first glance, the Invictus looks a lot like the abandoned and much talked about Sikorsky RAH-66 Comanche helicopter. Now the RH-66 was sacrificed on the altar of cost savings in the early 2000s when it became clear that the war on terror was going to be a prolonged fight against a relatively unsophisticated opponents intended to replace the cheap but vulnerable OH-58 Kiowa in the scout role. The RAH-66 was designed to operate in the high threat environment envisioned in the European Cold War and uh, never really happened which of course turned hot which was a good thing. Unfortunately for the Comanche though, such survivability came with a huge price tag. By the time of the cancellation, the program had already consumed $7 billion in development and demonstration funding, with a further cost of over $30 billion anticipated for the production of 1,200 frontline aircraft. The battlefield the RH-66 was exquisitely molded to, to survive on anyway, was completely vanished and for good it seemed with the cold of the end war. But questions began to be raised about the peace dividends, but the army stubbornly continued with the Comanche program. The game changer was the war on terror. Helicopters were suddenly very important to support campaigns in Iraq and Afghanistan, and in service types such as the CH-47, AH-64 and UH-60 needed upgrades to operate and survive in harsh environments and extensive low-tech threat conditions found in both theatres. The Comanche's expensive attributes, both stealth and speed, were just no longer, unfortunately, required. Now I have to personally say that I really do love the Comanche aircraft, I really do feel like it was an aircraft that should have come into the you know spotlight and been brought into the modern day world, and we'll talk a little bit later on about contracts that never came through for US military helicopter programs, but it looks like the Invictus could be the telltale signs of a Comanche hybrid of some kind, just a hell of a lot cheaper. Let's just hope it does. For the Comanche though, still a lot had to be done. A congressional report of the United States in 2003 noted that its capabilities and mission requirements were developed in response to a Cold War threat environment that no longer exists. The US Army elected to recapitalize the Comanche production funding by updating its legacy fleets, investing in UAVs, most of the all range at the time kind of setup, and by purchasing a new cheaper helicopter to replace the OH-58 Kiowa. This latter policy became really unglued very quickly. Attempts to buy the ARH-70 single source from Bell fell apart, and the palliative measure for reassigning the AH-64 Apache to a scout role was immensely unpopular with the broader army community. National Guard AH-64 attack units found their aircraft being reassigned back to the regular army and replaced with UH-60 Blackhawk utility helicopters. It was quickly pointed out by vocal critics of the policy that it was absurdly expensive to use full-up attack helicopters in a scout role, despite the best efforts of the army to justify it by attempts to team it with the unmanned area vehicles under the Manned Unmanned Teaming or MUMT programs, it just wasn't successful. However, we're back again with a new design and in a big way. While Western militaries were fighting low light conditions, extreme temperatures and threat environment characterized by shoulder launched heating seeking missiles, man pads or man portable air defense systems, rocket propelled grenades and guns of every caliber, our international competitors were investing hard in radar guided surface to air missiles or SAMs and advanced anti-aircraft guns. They have also significantly upped their game in the fields of electronic warfare. 
denying, degrading, destroying, confusing, or spoofing friendly radars via electronic means, jamming of radars and GPS, and finally, cyber warfare. Coupled with an increasingly confrontational stance from certain nations around the world, it's key to say that they wanted to assert the place in the world for the proliferation of advanced weapon systems to third parties, including those involved in proxy wars. The threat board for rotary wing aviation had spiked dramatically in the recent years, compared to the low-tech threat that they saw in Afghanistan and Iraq. To survive this back to the future environment, we may as well need technologies designed to aid platform protection back in the bad old days. This is where an aircraft like the Bell Invictus perhaps inevitably starts to reassemble platforms designed for that type of approach. Key design similarities and their rationale are 1. Angular fuselage shape. This is for two reasons. Firstly, and most obvious thinking about the designs, the angles of the Invictus will be very carefully calculated to minimize the aircraft's radar cross signature or RCS. As with most low observable platforms, the RCS reduction will be optimized from specific aspects. As Farah will be a scout aircraft, it's reasonable to assume that the frontal aspect of the RCS has been optimized in the design. Secondly, somewhat more prosaic, is the shape and packaging of the Invictus mirrors, the Comanche, in reducing to a practical, minimal fuselage size. This makes the Invictus harder to visually acquire, and a smaller target to attempt to hit with ballistic weapons. It is also worth noting that the rotor hub is also shrouded to reduce the RCS, and possibly sun glint. Finally, an arrowhead is considered as a very efficient aerodynamic shape, and one that is reflected in the Invictus's basic form. Therefore, we can suggest that the aerodynamic efficiency has also been a key design driver for Bell engineers. Second point, internal weapons carriaging. The RAH-66 carried its weapons internally. The Invictus plans to do the same. Weapons in bays are a fundamental part of LO design, and all stealth aircraft have them. Missiles, due to their need for the seeker heads and guidance fins, are often distinctively non-stealthy. Indeed, the entire RCS of the Comanche, while classified, was rumoured to assemble the Hellfire missile. Not only are the missiles non-stealthy, they're also quite draggy. Aerodynamically, when they're externally carried, the weapons not only slow the platform down, but will also increase fuel burn and therefore reduce its range. Being a scout helicopter, you're going to want range. Finally, missiles and rockets contain explosive warheads and sensitive electronics. Mounted on weapons pylons, they are very vulnerable to both enemy fire, potentially causing a catastrophic daisy chain detonation, and electronic cyber attack, which is one of the main premises of this aircraft trying to counter. Protected and shielded in a weapons base, missiles are much safer to host on the platform. Much like the F-35 in its configuration of literally beast mode, the Comanche can have conventional war capability with fitting extra external pylons to boost the weapon load and for the need of the LO characteristics considered less important. Given that the Invictus already has lift compounding wings fitted, these may be well stressed and plumbed for weapons and fuel tanks carriage as well. It's not yet clear whether Bell is actually going to get the weapon system on the front or the main gun to stow when not in use like the Comanches did. The third major point is the retractable undercarriage. Although it adds weight and complexity to a helicopter, the use of a retractable gear on the both the Comanche and the Invictus is consistent with reducing the overall RCS, visual signature, and drag. Fourth point, it's shrouded tilter tail rotor. This is really a clever piece of homage to the Comanche. The shrouded rotor, or fenestron as it's known in Europe, provides significant signature in reduction of benefits of drag and stealth. Firstly, it's generating a smaller RCS with a conventional tail rotor. Secondly, it also reduces the acoustic signature, which remains important on the modern battlefield. You can hear helicopters coming from a long, long, long way away, especially when you want it to be a scout helicopter. The tilted rotor actually helps generate free lift in the hover and at low speeds, helping the flight control system to level the aircraft for weapons release and reducing the power required to hover. This gives the pilot a little bit of spare power to either enhance platform agility, for example to avoid an RPG, or to take an increased payload. Therefore, to a point, the form does allow for functionality. However, there are a few key differences to the Comanche that the Invictus is displaying in these first sign images. Firstly, the wing. It's fundamental difference between the two aircraft. The design speed for the Farah is around 200 knots. Comanche topped out at around 180 knots. 
The wing provides a lift compounding to the rotor blades. At high speed they generate enough lift to unload some of the aerodynamic burden from the rotor disc, enabling the angle of attack. The blade angle relative to the oncoming airflow to be reduced. This is important for helicopters as too much angle of attack at too high of a speed can cause the onset of a condition known as retreating blade stall, which can cause a violent departure from the controlled flight. It's yet to be confirmed by Bell, but thrust compounding also opens the door by slowing the main rotor down. This is a very, very important point for this aircraft. On conventional helicopters, this tip velocity can reach near supersonic speeds, causing significant drag and vibration issues. High tip speeds are also a major factor in helicopter noise profile. Therefore, an ability to slow the rotor down at high speed is beneficial in performance and signature terms. Secondly, it's IR signature. Comanche had a complex internal structure that buried the engines and cooled the exhaust gases internally before they were released into ambient air. This reduced the aircraft's infrared signature and making it harder to target and acquire and track either by electro-optical sensors or IR missile seeker heads. The Invictus has a much more conventional engine exhaust system. Doubtless that there will be an IR suppression technique applied internally as it appears that the intake and exhaust are on opposite sides. I would probably tell you that the engineers at the uh, you know Bell Systems have talked about the engines and transmissions being surrounded by thermal protection blankets to minimize the hot metal signature that modern missile seekers are looking to detect. Thirdly, supplementary power. Bell's initial press release refers to an intriguing piece of kit that they term as a supplementary power source. Geared from the main transmission, Bell cite that the system can be called upon to provide more speed and power when required, almost like a boost mode. The obvious uses for extra power could be to enable a short duration of dash to evade a threat or improve maneuver potential. This could also facilitate hovering at high altitude or, with one eye on the future, having a power bank for discharged direct energy weapons. This will no doubt be a feature that the industry will look a lot more closely in the future for the aviation world for helicopters. Finally, it's built to a cost. The fact that the Invictus is not going to be a full Comanche style aircraft is as much to do with its cost than it is its capability requirements. Bell have listened very closely to the Army's needs and the price control is a very big driver, just to anything nowadays in a military contract. Comanche was cancelled for financial, not technical reasons. Let's make that very clear. If there was a lot more money, we could have had one of the most successful helicopters ever produced. Costs are reduced by having a single engine, the use of less exotic materials, and reusing significant elements of the Bell 525 relentless transmission and rotor system. The Invictus is an intriguing overall package. As more details are released about the concept and the broader fire program, there is no doubt going to be a lot of questions that will need to be answered, and a lot of new ones raised. However, there is an important larger point to all this. The US Army has consistently failed to field a new helicopter type since the UH-60 and AH-64 in the 1970s. The UH-72 Lakota was effectively a mature, civil-designed, painted green helicopter with a few military extras. Programs have been started and cancelled over and over again, while successfully managing upgrades to legacy types. This failure to introduce a standalone new platform has resulted in wasting billions of dollars and several questions over the Army's acquisition process of these types of new aircraft. With FLRAA and FARA, the US Army has two headline programs underway. Surely this time, failure is not an option. I think this helicopter has a lot of basis to it. I was really sad when I was younger knowing that the Comanche never came to be. I used to play it on the Nova Logic games, it was so much fun. Uh, you looked at the helicopter, you're like, wow, that is the future of Helos. You know, I love the Apache 2, it served with me in Afghanistan, protecting me, angels on my wings. Thank you to those who did operate and pilot those things, my goodness, they're incredible. But, you know, in terms of a scout helicopter, you cannot put Apaches in a scout helicopter role. They need something light, fast, sleek, and, you know, a low signature to engage. This is potentially the future, and I'm kind of curious to see what's going to come from it. I hope you enjoyed today's video, everyone. Please leave me a like, and if you want to be notified of any upcoming videos, hit the little bell button by the subscribe button so you can be notified of any upcoming military content I produce in the future. You can also leave me a comment, I'll try my best to reply to you. If you do want to support my channel, you can go check out my Patreon page and support account, which is in the description box below, along with the rest of my social media, uh, merchandise, Discord channel, etc, etc. 
I really appreciate you being here today, folks. Have a wonderful day. All the best. Bye-bye.